And we are alive, and we are blessed to have a church full of people. And we know there are a bunch of people following us online as we continue in our continual study of the Song of Solomon. And uh, we are at Lesson 7, so that means we're on the back end of our study. And tonight is, as we said when we began this study, there's not a whole lot of commentary on it. And the commentaries that I read said that it's not talked about a whole lot, or certainly preached on Sundays a whole lot, because of sort of what the lesson's about. At night, if I had it on television, we would be a sellout, because, hey, what sells in society today? Okay. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We're going to have one of those tonight. <laughs> Tonight's title is What God Thinks of Sex. Now, that's a touchy subject because, you know, the way society has really ruined it, uh, obviously sex in its place is beautiful. We're going to find that out tonight. But, you know, we as humans have kind of destroyed it and made it look in a more negative light. And, you know, churches throughout here, when we were growing up, were saying you can't talk about it. But the Bible talks about it. We're going to talk about it tonight as we're continuing on this study of Solomon. And Shulamite, as we said, she was this beautiful young lady, and we're going to find out what she looks like tonight. Uh, and as I said from the beginning, you know, radio and books have a better, give you a better picture than a television or a movie ever could. And I, for those who listen, can have heard me say that before, because you think about it. Of all the times when you read books or think same things in your mind, you picture it. And then when somebody puts it on a video or a television, it may be different than what you think, but it's always better in your picture because you have it in your mind. So we're going to get a picture of this lady tonight as we go through it. But remember, she was this young lady who lived out in Lebanon, you know, in the northern part of Israel. And like I said, if I was a good teacher, like my counterpart Rusty here, I'd have my skirt slide up here and Nancy working the buttons over here and we'd flash it up. Ain't got time to put it together. But remember, Galilee was the northern area, northern area of Israel. And the Jordan River runs down, and Jerusalem was down in the south. She was from up in the northern region. We know that she was a country girl. She was a farmer. Uh, worked the vineyards. Um, we found out when that he fell in love with her on one of his trips and was smitten by her. And couldn't get her out of his mind, and he was kind of wooing her and chasing her for the first couple chapters of the book. And uh, she was a little nervous. Obviously, if it would be just like a young lady today from down in our country, was the father of the governor or the president, and then he was willing her and taking her to all the parties and things and why she's in Raleigh, wherever it may be. They'd be a little bit nervous, and she was a little nervous of being, uh, having to come into contact with the fancy ladies in the, uh, in the capital. And one time she told us that she got in a little trouble with the family and they made her stay out in the sun and that she had, her skin had gotten a little darker than she thought because in those days a tan wasn't a good thing. Now today we all love a nice tan. Right, you know? <laughs> uh, we all love a nice tan. But she did and she was being kind of catted about it. And then we kind of went back and forth and, and we said this book is not really chronological. Uh, it's a poem. It's a song. It was the great song or should be the greatest song that Solomon wrote. And he wrote over a thousand and five of them, I think. Uh, we learned in Sunday school, by the way, this is one of five books that the Orthodox Jewish people sing at their feast, along with Ruth, uh, Esther, and Ecclesiastes. The Song of Solomon is read at one of the great feasts that the Jewish people celebrate every year. Now, does anybody know why I told you in Sunday school Sunday what? Holiday it was that Purim. Purim. Passover. Purim was the one we were studying. Purim was the feast that we studied of Esther. But when we when they had Passover, which we just passed, is the time period where we study Israel. This book is written. Now, also the commentary said that the uh, population or the educated people at the time wouldn't let males read it until they turned thirty-five. Now, I don't know how you do that, and I don't know how children were born, but anyway, that's sort, sort of what was going on there. That's the story, and it's one of the great books uh, in Jewish history. Last week, we had the great wedding, and Solomon had come from Jerusalem to pick up his wife 
to be and bring her back in that entourage of 70 valiant men, uh, this great carriage made of cedar and gold and silver and butterback, and we had the big wedding and the big celebration that we said could last up to a week or two because all you have to go back and remember is Jesus turning the water into wine in Cana. That was one of his big celebrations. So the wedding has happened, and that's what we're going to pick up tonight as we will read in chapter 4 after I open up with a prayer. Father, once again, thank you for the privilege it is to expound on this book. I ask that you speak through me, give me the words to speak, and let us have ears to hear. And we thank you for the opportunity you've given us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our readers will begin in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1, and read through the first verse of chapter 5. First verse of 5. I'm reading from the New American Standard in case it doesn't match up with uh, your versions. Solomon's love expressed. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn bees, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins. And not one among them has lost her young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, filled with rows of stones on which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Sinar and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your oils, than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of leather. A garden lock is my sister, my bride. A rock garden lock, a spring sealed up. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon. With all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with all the finest spices, you are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, and streams flowing from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south, make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends. Drink and revival deeper of lovers. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Praise be to God. And certainly, God bless the reading and exposition of His word. There's three characters in this story. Two of them are obvious. The one, you may not think of obvious, but we'll talk about it once we get to the very end of the lesson. In 1992, some people may have read this. There's a great there's a book by John Gray that re, was written called Men Are From Mars. Oh, yes. Women Are From. Venus. It talks about the differences of men and women and how we think and how we act and do those things. Uh, there was that book that was a bestseller, and then there was another book written shortly after about the difference called Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. And they talk about the differences between men and women in one illustrated, extended illustration. It's the his and her guide to automatic drive through cash machine. Yes, this is how guys do, deal with that. Pulls up to the automatic drive through cash machine. Inserts card, enters PIN number, takes cash, card, and receipt, leaves. 
lady pulls up to the automatic drive through to the cash machine, checks makeup in the rear view mirror, shuts off the engine, puts keys in the handbag, gets out of the car because it's pulled up too far from the machine, hunts for her ATM card in the handbag, inserts card, hunts in the back handbag for a scrap of paper that has a pin number on it. He enters the pin number, hit cancel, re enter the correct pin number, check balance, look for a deposit slip, sign checks, make deposits, make cash withdrawal, get back in car, check makeup in the rearview mirror, start car, start pulling it up, away, stop, back up, get out of the car, take credit card and receipt from the machine, get back in the car, put the car in the wallet, put the seat in the checkbook, put the car in the drive, drive away from the machine, travel three miles, and release handbrake. Yeah. You've got to have a little bit of com comedy as we've been going through this and we have to some jokes to come through. But as humorous as the differences of the sexes may be in how we see and do things, uh, it begins to make sense when we see the idea of God's intentions <coughs> beginning with God's plan for sexuality. We consider how the world understands and defines what we call sexual intimacy these days. The secular model sees the sexual drive as an animal instinct, something that is placed in us by nature to motivate the reproduction of the species. It's a drive, you know, some of us are sex addicts and can't lay off of it, right? like alcohol and you know, all these other things. If you happen to feel pleasure in it, that's something of an illusion in that it only, it's only there to make you fulfill the appropriate added duty in replenishing the world. So you have all these different ideas. It's a drive, it's a, a necessity, it's all these different things. And we get absolutely reproduction is certainly part of God's mandate for us. If you go back to the beginning of Genesis, he said, go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And all I can think of is the little house in the prairie that time after Charles had had like the fourth or fifth child, child, and the preacher said, I don't think he meant for you to do that literally. <laughs> Go forth and you know, have something that you can punish the earth. But, you know, we all know people that love to have all children, and yes, reproduction is certainly part of God's plan for it. But the Word of God certainly reveals that our sexuality is part of who we are right down to our soul. Uh, right down to who we are. Scripture tells us we are made in the image of God. And physical reproduction is one of those wonderful and miraculous byproducts of something wonderful and miraculous already created by God. Because when we say the idea of intimacy, God is the creator. He is who made it. We, as a society, people are the ones who ruin it. The true fulfillment, we know, of a lasting love relationship is a result of what the true meaning of what it was supposed to be for. Commentary tells us, quote, if we pick a wildflower and take it from its natural environment, it wilts very quickly, correct? So too, the satisfaction of, short, of sex is short-lived when it's torn from the setting in which God originally designed it. Now that's a deep statement there, but if you think about it, is it the truth? Absolutely. Another writer put it this way, monogamy may not sound like much fun, certainly not in comparison to its alternative. Monogamy sounds a lot like monogamy, does it? Or monopoly. Do I hear mahogany? Yet we dare not relate monogamy to the tedium, an endless board game or great ant's table. True happiness, the deep, sustained contentment that we truly see, lies somewhere down the monogamy road. Those whose lifestyles are entrenched in the spirit of the age preach the gospel of one night stands. They declare themselves liberated from the baggage of lifelong relationships that may grow tedious and it's time to move on. They say that we have to have sex with no strings attached, but in turn, but it turns out that the strings tie us to our only chance for true joy and ultimate life. And the no attachments approach is really real imprisonment, if you think about it. All the people, the movie stars you see are moving from place to place. And the Song of Solomon is the Bible certainly case study of a plan for all seasons in the life of a created people. We had seen the courting stage. You know, Joe, I remember as a kid, they used to say, well, he's out courting, or she's out courting. I used to have an old time ago, but the dating process, the courting, the dating, 
the engagement, the wedding, and of course the life together for the rest of our lives. We've seen up to this point the, the courting, the courtship, the dating, the engagement, and then the wedding. And chapter 4 brings us to the honeymoon. I love what Dr. Jeremiah says. One, the deepest joys of intimacy are detailed here. Accent on the word detail. This Bible study is for mature believers. And he's, he's, he doesn't say it, but that's what he's saying. Let's discover what we learn as we go into what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lives, tells us about the biblical honeymoon. First of all, he begins in the first couple of verses by talking about preparing for the intimacy. Verses 1 through 7 that Nancy read tell us about the preparation for the intimate moments that he was going to share with Shulamite. And of course, there's a lot of things for us to learn here that really come from the differences between men and women. How we think and how we feel. Now Solomon begins the Shulamite saying, Behold, you are fair. And this is not the first time that he's told her that she's fair, my love. Behold, you were fair. A few verses later on, she's, he's saying to her, You are all fair, my love, and there is not a spot in you. Now we kind of laugh at some of, some of this stuff that we're going to talk about seems kind of funny in the terminology that we understand today. But in other days, she understood exactly what he was talking about. This is nothing different today. Why do we say, you're the most prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life? She's as pretty as a peach. I mean, we're no different today in the way that we compare things. We just have different terminology. So he's beginning to talk about that because one of the things we see is that women, when it comes to us, are prepared by what we say, guys. Men are designed by God in such a way that when it comes time, I'm going to quote Dr. Jeremiah, when it comes time, they are, let me rephrase it back up. Men are designed by God in such a way that when time comes, we are more than ready to take care of business. Unfortunately, men tend not to realize that the wife is not that way. She has to be prepared emotionally. The husband is excited and eager. The wife is headed and sometimes needs the grace of truth. She designed in such a way that requires preparation, including mental stimulation. Her mind and imagination are the important trigger points, and a man needs to use, learn to use the language that motivates her in it all about what she hears. Here lies the problem with most men. We're not as good with words as we should be. We need a few right words. But Solomon had no problem with this. He was full of etiquette. He had what we call in the Old Testament the wisdom of Solomon. How many times have we read that in scripture throughout the years that such and such as the wisdom of Solomon? He knew the way to a woman's heart. Now later on we find out he had more than one to practice on. Later on we find out in his life he had 300 of these lives and a thousand concubines. But at this point, remember, he is in love with one woman at this time. Later on we you know the story goes south. But at this point, he sort of knows what he's talking about. He speaks in simple words about her beauty. Uh, we don't have to memorize the sonnets of Shakespeare or all the books that we see. Notice Solomon tells her right off the bat, why like any woman would love to be told, baby, you are beautiful. You are gorgeous. You are drop dead gorgeous. You are it. He does it very simply, and he does it twice here. Then in verse 7, he adds another declaration of just how beautiful she is. <coughs> and he adds, not only are you beautiful, you are perfect in every way. Now, my father used to tell me that when you're courting or in love, with the emphasis of L-O-V-E or L-U-V-E, he says you begin to look through something called rose-colored glasses. Now, she may be as ugly as sin, but when you're that way and you're smitten, she's just as pretty as ever come. But Solomon looked at the eyes of love and he said, baby, you are perfect. You are perfect in the way when I look at you. Now, in Hebrew literature, there is when something is said three times, it is said with a strong, intense version of trying to get a point across. Sort of like throughout you know, the old King James, Jesus will say, very, very. If it's repeated, you better pay attention to it. 
like over in Revelation, holy, holy, holy. Remember we say in chapter 5 of Revelation. Therefore, uh, when something is said that, pay attention to it. The words alone may not truly capture the power of Solomon's feelings, but he is trying to get a point across to her as he is with her now as everybody's maybe going home, the party's out. You are unbelievably lovely. You're an 11 on a scale of 10. Then he says you're perfect in every way. Well, it's true, of course, that there's only one woman who ever created that was perfect in who she was. Eve, until she beat a, in a apple. But at the original time, she was created perfect, and then it's all been downhill from there for all of us. Uh, but the honeymoon isn't a time for us to be overtly literal. I mean, we say what we need to say to get the point across. You know, we know that nobody's perfect, but in our eyes, maybe you are perfect. You're just not paying attention to that. So anyway, he's beginning to prepare her by speaking the word that she needs to hear. Now, women are prepared by what you say. If men are prepared by what? You might know? They might say. We see. If women are prepared, if men are prepared by what they see. Now, we know that's not breaking news. Men are visually stimulated by the beauty of their wife and the, and the woman. And certainly, we see what's going on. That's why the makeup uh, industry is so popular in all fancy clothes and all that. Now, my wife would just say, Amen to this back there. As men, we don't always listen well, right? <laughs> Married people. But there's nothing wrong with our eyesight, right? Nobody's, nobody's saying Amen to this. The women are all for it. We say that again. As men, we don't always listen well, but there's usually nothing wrong with our eyesight. <laughs> we see the beauty of our wives and we're ready to act. We simply need to understand the difference here. We are moved, and Solomon is no different. He's looking at her, he's motivated by what he sees, and he's motivating her by what, he's, what she hears. Now, how visual the next six verses are. This is a man, remember, he's stepping back in the time on his wedding night. And Dr. Jeremiah says, you can better believe his eyes are wide open. <laughs> he takes inventory of all the beauty that he can see. So much of it probably was hidden before by the wedding dress and the veil and all the things they wore and they still wear today. Um, but we really need to know that the Word of God endorses the wholesomeness of this relationship with this man and woman who have been married and are fulfilling what the Lord created in this situation. So let's move on as Solomon begins to describe to us what he sees in the beauty of the Shulamite. First of all, he describes probably the starting point in beauty in most women, as guys look at it. What's the thing that we know to draw about? How beautiful her eyes are. Now, he's discussed that before. Uh, we know that the, wind, the eyes are the windows to the soul, which is the most expression, most expressive feature we have. A woman's eyes are the focus of her beauty. And we said more than once we can learn what our spouse is seeing, and they don't even need to say a word, all they got to do is look at it a certain way, and you know, don't go there. Don't say that, right? She's laughing at that. Uh, the eyes are a window to the soul. Sodom begins, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. So most likely she still has the veil. Brides with these facial covers that are now, you know, all still part of it. They're wearing a white veil, so you'll pull it back on it. So this passage would suggest that at this particular time when he's writing this, the veil stayed on until the couple left the party in the celebration and went on to where they were going to go. Solomon suggests here that his bride's eyes were shining right through the veil. She her eyes were so beautiful. The literal meaning translates is that the veil highlights Shulamite's eyes. So he was looking and he saw the twinkle in her eyes, even before he began to look at her, the rest of her beauty. On her wedding day, we know that a bride has shining eyes. We hope, unless they're being forced to get married. But most likely, a woman's in love at marriage. And they are, oh, uh, yeah, and their eyes are everything. A bride has shining eyes on that particular point. And Solomon's eyes are filled 
with delight as he looks at the beautiful eye of a woman who he had just married. Some people when that are older than others may believe there was a popular song that went out, I think it was during the 50s or 60s, that says, I only have eyes for you. Anybody remember that song? Mm -hmm. yeah. So considering that uh, Solomon would say again yeah, that the song was written many thousand years later, Solomon begins and he looks at her at her beautiful eyes. Think of Solomon reaching a minute in his particular patient and softly removing the veil. And as he does so, the hair begins to tumble freely over her shoulders. Certainly, once again, we're puzzled by this ancient world picture that seems so out of place to our society. And he begins to say, your honey, honey, your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Now, I don't suggest that we go and tell our wives that today. Say, so, honey, uh, you look like your hair looks like goats. Or what we say, you look like rat nest, you know. You know but in his day, he knew something that she would take as a compliment. Because remember a couple chapters ago, so he was the ex existential naturalist. He was well versed in the, in the um, natural things of the world. Solomon constantly thinks of the beauty of outdoor life and he translates it from the things that she may know. He's comparing her to animals and the plants and the geographical features all throughout the book. Now, you and I might not see much loveliness in a goat as I'm standing here, but when we stop to consider all the things that God had created, there's beauty in everything, right? In this case, the imagery would be particularly well chosen and well known to the people of this society. The sight of a woman's long, silky tresses cascading around her neck and shoulder certainly would be a delight in a man's eyes, long, flowing hair. Well, in Palestine or Israel during this time period, there was goats there, and they were known to have long, wavy. Anybody know what kind of hair problem? Black. Hey, say I don't think she was blonde. We did not know it. I mean, I love it. Black. Solomon mentions Gilead. It was a place that was more than three thousand three hundred feet above sea level, with this magnificent view of the Sea of Galilee. Along those hills and places, there was a, it was a considered a fine place for grazing cattle. And at dusk, on a night, on a good afternoon, the shepherd would guide his flocks down the slopes and back to the shelter where they would stay during the night. If you and I were standing at a distance watching the flock descend the mountainside, it might seem like the mountainside was alive, shimmering and moving with black cascading hair. So when he looks at her, he begins to see that she has this long, cascading black curly hair. So we know that she's got dark hair. So he's beginning to look at her eyes. Then he begins to look at her black curly hair. The next thing he looks to is her teeth. Teeth are important things. Solomon says, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from washing. Every one of them which bears twins and not one of them is barren of them. Now, as I said, now, <laughs> if you were to say that, that might ruin the mood if you know, you're trying to work with your wife, and then your teeth look like my sheep. But I, once again, we've got to step back into the time period. <coughs> she is catching on exactly what he's saying. Now, we all know that sheep are sheer. Certain times of the year, they take the wool off them. The owl wool is removed, and most of the time during the time when they got it, they're nasty because they roll around in the dirt and they're not clean and it's kind of a dark color. But when they shear all that outer wool is removed, the person who's looking would see a great transformation. A sparkling white sheep would be stepping away from the lining of the mud and dirt that had been its outer coating. You see the connect here? The flock is shining white like her teeth. She has beautiful white teeth. Now, I don't know how they have two great faces brushes back then, and fluoride and all that. She somehow must have not drank a lot of coffee or smoked or did anything because her teeth were white. That's all the stuff the dentist office said. Stay away from tea and coffee and wine because it stains your teeth. You know, when you get always tell you something wrong with it. But he looks at her and her teeth are just shiny white. Now the next part of the verse, think of it from an orthodontist's view. Every one of which bears twins. 
If you think about it, each tooth in your mouth has a twin on the other side. If you got a tooth here, there's one here, 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 all the way around. She's not snaggle tooth. She don't have braces. She had a knockout. She has a perfectly white set of teeth that's symmetrical. When she smiled. She has a smile like Hollywood. She walked in West Virginia. No, she was not in the back of the West Virginia. <laughs> so she has a perfectly set of teeth. So she's got long, flowing hair, beautiful eyes, and a nice set of white teeth. Well, his roving eye begins to move a little further down from the fine teeth to her beautiful lips. And he describes her lips as a strand of scarlet in verse 3. It's generally felt for most commentaries that she was using some kind of lip cover. And of course, as guys, what's her favorite lipstick? Red. We don't know about cosmetics. Obviously, they're not a modern innovation. Somehow she had found some kind of coloring that she used to put on her lips to make her lips red. By the way, the color scarlet is used 52 times in the Bible. And certainly, what color do we know her skin probably is? Okay. Color low, the most likely because she's tan. So she's got beautiful black hair, white teeth, which you know, a dark complexion makes your teeth look whiter anyway, beautiful eyes, and red lipstick, and it would be accentuated by her dark skin. So I'm going to paint the picture, guys. This is probably a beautiful woman. Well, remaining in the general vicinity of the lips, Solomon turns his attention to something else. He says, and beloved, and your mouth is lovely. She has a beautiful set of lips. Not only do they color, but she has a beautiful mouth. As one writer says, now he's talking kissing talk. Paige Patterson, who has written some of the great commentaries that Dr. Jeremiah uses a lot here, says, you know, this is, could not only be talking about the color and the physical aspect of her lips, but something else that really could either make a woman or turn her off. What would that be? Anybody know? Her speech. Her speech. And Dr. Jeremiah says, have you ever been in a restaurant or have somebody come up and you see this drop dead gorgeous woman walk up and she's all right and the minute she opens her mouth you want to walk out the back of the she, she, her mouth moves. Mm -hmm. So we may, if you could go either way, several different commentaries are looking at this from two points of view. Some say that maybe she has red lipstick and a beautiful set of lips that she'd be looking at. And others say that not only does she have a beautiful lips, but when she spoke, she spoke words of grace. Words that really were dripping with honey that he loved about her. Beauty is as beauty speaks, right? So she is on it. And of course, um, I love what he said. When you fell in love, weren't you attracted to the way your spouse spoke? And, and notice, love the way that your spouse spoke and the things they said. So Solomon is in love with, with that. Well, as he is moving down in beauty, as he's describing her to us, and as he sees her, he's come away from the eyes and the hair, the teeth, the lips, and the mouth to her temples. He says, your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Once again, Probably don't want to go home and yet tell the head, he said, your, she, your temples look like pomegranates. Mm -hmm. But according to this, the temple is, is defined as the part of the face between the eye and the ears. I guess it's moving this area here. But particular in ancient literature, the Hebrew word, word refers to, anybody know what he's talking about? Cheeks. Or cheeks. That's what mine says. Cheeks. Yeah. cheeks. So not, he's talking about here. So he's looked here. And here now he's looking at the face. He's looking at her cheeks. So it begins to make sense. The pomegranate, if you open the pomegranate, it's going to be red inside, right? So she has rosy red cheeks. So a woman's cheeks certainly are an important part of her facial feature. Ask any woman who works at Belks or Macy's or Dillard's, there's that whole section that goes, you see women sitting up there really doing them, get their face painted, putting their War paint on his daddy's car. Mm -hmm. The eyeshadow, lipstick, and mascara, and all that good stuff. The cheek is thought to be the gentlest part of the whole female body, and it tells us a little something of a person's emotion when you brush. So as she's standing there and he's looking at her, she's beginning to blush, ladies. Uh, or 
If you turn away in the cheeks, you may want to run out the back door. So the blood certainly has certainly been viewed as a sign of innocence and love from them, and a token, as history tells us, of virginity. Now about the fruit factor that he described about. We find plenty of juicy red pomegranates. If you go to the grocery store, you can get one of them. And I don't know if I've ever eaten them. Anybody read the pomegranates? Oh, yeah. They're, they're good. good. Good and sweet. Obviously, Psalm is thinking about that rosy color of the fruit. But some of the other commentaries talk about another angle, just as we are suspected as we're describing the beauty of her face and her mouth. In the ancient world, pomegranates were associated with an aphrodisiac and sexuality. So they very well could be. He's looking at it from that point of view as he began to look at it. Either way, hey, take it and go with it. But he's describing just how beautiful she is. Certainly her blush uh, as her groom is staring at her would be sort of what we call today blushing bride. Moving on, as we move down, he begins to describe her neck. You see where he's going, right? He's moving on down. Uh, He's looked at her eyes, and he's going to her hair, to her teeth, and her lips, and her mouth, and cheeks, and now he looks at her neck. He says, baby, your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an army, in which there's a thousand bucklers, all shields, and mighty men there. She must have a long, majestic, nice neck. And in ancient times, a long, slender, majestic neck was considered part of the beauty of a woman. At least he didn't say giraffe. <laughs> Yeah, that would be kind of out of the way, right? Yeah. Obviously, if it's got all these things on it, what does she probably have around her neck? Jewels. Some type of jewelry that he's describing as it's going down, all these different shields and bucklers that he's describing. So she has this beautiful neck that probably has necklaces on it, maybe has earrings that are hanging down. And he begins to see the beauty of Jewel as he's looking at her. And of course, she, you know, she's the ultimate. Uh, crown rule, jewel. Well, the last thing that he describes here is given the manner in which culture has vulgarized sexuality to violate it down to certain parts. This section is a little more delicate. For Solomon and his time, the connotation was certainly proper to what he describes here, especially in the context of what Michael talked about. It. He begins to go and says, Your two breaths are like two fawns. Twins of the gazelle, which feed among the lilies. So until now, Solomon had been given his, uh, her, his commentary from the neck up. Now his eyes have come to the slim, youthful body of his bride. He begins to see the beauty of her body. And the image that he chooses to tell us, remember Solomon chose these particular words for us to say, and the Holy Spirit was put in the scripture. Something of grace, and softness, twin fawn. You know, the fawn was small and soft and tender. Little nimble animals, easily frightened that can get out and run away. So we, you see those, you think of grace, you think of beauty, and all that. And what is something? What does everybody want to do to a little fawn when they see it? They want to pick it up, play with it, don't they? <laughs> do I need to say any more? Okay. Solomon wants to be gentle but apprehensive with his bride. And it's soft and soothing rather than being full of force. Now, we'll move on to that. So we can learn a lot from that. Um, even in our intimate moments, we speak to a wife in a language that she understands to be loved and appreciated. And Carol and James wanted me to teach this, and this is why he wanted me to teach it. For those that are following up now, I've been for years at all the Bible studies, and he always wanted to study this. So he's getting it from heaven now and laughing. So the physical inventory comes to an end in the sixth verse. He's described her beauty and the end to it. And then he says, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now compare this verse to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. 17, which is very close in the word. The subject is desire, and the meaning we know is fairly obvious. Solomon is looking forward to a very enjoyable evening, and sleep doesn't figure much in his thinking. <laughs> but he didn't say anymore. 
The reference to myrrh and frankincense reminds us that this is a wealthy man. He's the richest man, never the richest man I've ever lived, surrounded by the finer things in life. But the finest of all that he has that can't be bought for any son, and it's a beautiful crown jewel his wife is standing there with. And he said, I don't plan to go anywhere. We're staying until daylight. So, as we look back over this section that we've had to have a little kid gloves, the two things I think we come away from it is time and tenderness. tenderness. Love doesn't hurry, but it takes time to stop and smell the roses. It's not selfish, but dedicated to the fact of taking care of the other partner. He's put her on a pedestal and is doing everything he can to be what she needs him to be. All of this is in anticipation of the intimacy as, as the first seven verses take us. Now verses 8 to 11 takes us to the anticipation that comes with it and the excitement that comes from the intimacy that he's talking about. Solomon says, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, and me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Ammon and the top of Sinar and Haman from the lion's den to the mountains of the lepers. Sometimes we can find out a little bit of information by parsing through the grammar that he talks about. For example, the first seven verses that we just examined, there's been only one personal pronoun, and it's you, you, you. It's all about her, right? This is unique to the Song of Solomon. Solomon is entirely the observer up to this point, completely wrapped up in the adoration of his beautiful wife. Now, however, we see a shift in pronouns from you to uh, me and I. He now calls her my bride. And we'll do so for a total of five different times in this little section. So no longer does he look at her, he sees how beautiful, and he realizes, hey, we're married. She's mine. She's my, my bride. The courting is complete. The wedding is accomplished. And as we begin to move forward, Solomon now looks at her as his own. She is his bride. And not as a separate individual. She's my bride. The eighth verse is certainly this loving invitation to the excitement. So, hey, it's time for us to come together and become intimate with one and no longer worry about the things of the world and everything that's out there. So certainly selflessness is the most neglected act in most of humanity. And here, he's showing the expression of how much he loves her and how much he cares for her and he's going to take care of her. Now, Paul would write this same kind of foundational speak, speak, statement that I meant in 1 Corinthians 7, where he says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. So certainly we began to talk about at that point is the giving together of one and quit being selfish and the selfishness that comes with being truly a married couple. I love what Dr. Jeremiah quotes here. Ours is a me and mine society. Anybody know that? Knows that everybody's it's all about me and mine these days. Ours is a me and mine society, sometimes even within the bounds of marriage, that we truly can experience the greatest joys in life in knowing Christ or in loving our spouse without the required element that Rusty was talking about the other night, dying us out and putting other people before us. Solomon is saying, I'm putting you before me to take care of me, to take care of your needs. And he certainly said, God, he's a lady, he's a real keeper in What is God? Solomon is saying, from now on, I devote myself to your joy and to your pleasure, and he invites her to come and experience the mountaintops and the dens of things with him. And certainly, he wants to enjoy it. And he says, you know, have you ever noticed, and you think about this, this is a God's honest truth. Have you ever noticed the emptiness that you, you feel when you see an incredible sight, maybe a beautiful sunset or a beautiful vision or a place and suddenly you don't have anybody to share with Because beautiful things you want to share with someone, your spouse, your best friend, something, you just don't want to keep it for yourself. You want to share it with somebody else. Everything feels richer and fuller when you've got somebody to share it with. Now, like I said, it could be a spouse, it could be a friend, it could be whoever it may be. And when we begin to feel the absence of that person during special moments, that's the proof that we have a passion for that person. Because if you can experience it, well, not me, I don't care what the other. Maybe you don't have the closest that you need to. But certainly, Solomon is saying, come with me, baby. There's a lot of the uh, 
She, I know she likes me to say that back there. Little Rod, yeah, come with me, and we can have this exciting time in life together. So he's beginning to anticipate. Now he begins to talk about the expression of the intimacy. We can't help but <coughs> express things that we get excited about. You know, when you see something, like I was talking about, I get excited when I get from teaching, I get talking to my admit, and you can't. <coughs> it's just overflow of joy when we see stuff that we really enjoy and we want to put it and tell somebody about it. You ever pick up the phone and say, oh, God, God, and you're like, what did he just say? This person's so excited on that end. Solomon communicates just how he feels in the next three verses. And he says, Baby, here's my brother Young, you have ravished me. I love that word, ravish. That's an old time word, right? You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with just one look of those beautiful eyes. With just one length of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse? How much better than wine is your love? And the scent of your perfume. Ooh, all those spices. And baby, your lips. Oh, oh, those lips. They drip like honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of that. Ooh, he's excited. <laughs> now the word for ravish means stole. Soul, sure, Mike has stole in this man's heart. What he's saying, you, I have lost control of everything I had. You owe me, I'm yours, and I belong to you, baby. I am just ruined. And then she reestablishes that ownership every time she looks at him with those beautiful eyes that look like those. Not only that, even a single link on her necklace is just too much for him to handle. He just doesn't mind. He is smitten. In other words, everything that concerns her sends him into a state of excitement. Now, the question is, I know you were probably asking, what in the world is him calling her sister? And that kind of throw a kink in here. But five times in the, in the course of Song of Solomon, he calls her my sister. Now, we wouldn't do that in our culture, certainly today. Hey, baby, hey, sister, come on over here now. Let's go to church. We talk about sisters in Christ. But in ancient days, it was quite normal during that time period. It was a word of endearment that implied respect and companionship that wasn't incompatible with romantic love. As a matter of fact, in the midst of the hot, this passion that they're having here, we forget she's his best friend. She's his lifelong partner. She's just more than a plaything. She is everything to him. She is his sister in, in love. So this deep, intimate companionship that he feels with her, he uses when he uses that word. We kind of think of it today as, you know, your sister, right. But he's using it in a more, in a different way. In verse 10, he began to talk about her fragrance. And we said, the one thing about the book of Psalm of Solomon that excites all the senses, the eyes. Remember when we came last week, he, he, in the wedding, the beautiful carriage that was coming with eyes, the sound of the trumpets, the smell of the incense being burned, the myrrh, the frankincense, the touch of what it would feel like to touch that thing. All the senses are here. And now he begins to, his sense of smell, he smells her fragrant. He says, your love, baby, is better than wine. Mm -hmm. And the scent, oh, you're better, you're, you're better than spice. All his senses are alive. He smells her, he tastes her, he sees her. He's, you see, that sight's already important in a guy's eyes, right? He sees her. Next to sight, the next best thing for a man is a smell. We love the smell. We know what food is the same way, right? We get excited and smell so it could be the kitchen. Somebody has figured out that out that not only do men love sight, but we love smell, because perfume companies account for approximately $2.3 billion in sales over the years per year. And that was written several years ago in this book we read. Women know that looks are paramount to their attention. But when that little dab of fragrance is added, it's in your niche. So she not only has taken care of herself in her beauty, body-wise, but her fragrance, she has beautiful, she has this nice smell of it. Then comes the not so subtle hint that the time for action is approaching. And Solomon said, baby, your lips, oh, your lips are. Oh, my spouse, they drip as honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. 
Now, I hesitate to become too detailed with this verse, especially when a commentary about Johnny Aiken would do more than I can ever say tonight. The idea that a particular kind of kissing began in France is put to death in this verse. You know what I'm talking about, right? The idea of deep, wet, sweet, passionate, quote, French kissing goes back as far as the time of Song of Solomon. I think we can agree with that and we'll move on. <laughs> Finally, we learn that not only has she taken care of her physical body and perfumed it, but she has perfumed her clothing as well as everything on the body. In every way, she is a solid trap. She's got the look, she's got the smell, and she is everything for him has taken care of all his senses. And I love what Dr. Jeremiah says, the more we take advantage of the good senses that God gave us, the more joy we find as we lose his life. The last section, we'll get through and we'll make it through here, is the appreciation of the intimacy. Finally, right here in the Bible, your Bible and mine is the ones that we come to the main event of the Bible. About time, I might have been sitting up here talking 45, 50 minutes about it. Solomon says, baby, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, and a fountain sealed. We quickly recognize this is a reference to Shulamite's purity. She, it was her virginity that he finds appreciation in. Solomon uses three metaphors to make the idea very clear to, about that. She is a walled garden, a blocked spring, and a sealed fountain. Why use three? We get the, we get the idea of with one out analogy, but the point is there's three different images of natural beauty that he sees her. She is a colorful garden to nourish what we say the eyes, the cool springs to quench your thirst, and the majestic fountain for the grace and beauty. So he is, all of these have been closed off until the proper time the Shulamite has saved herself for her man. He also begins to tell her, he says, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant hymn with spikenard, spikenard and saffron. Calvus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh, aloes, and all the chief spice. He's lingering around in his garden metaphor because certainly it's a perfectly apt analogy to what he's talking about. She is beautiful. She's natural. And she is supplying everything that he wants and needs to, to get away from everything that's going on. And certainly the bride supplies all those wonderful gifts to her husband as he's a, she is a delight to his eyes and she's nourishing his soul and providing everything he needs. Now, uh, Jeremiah says, ask, he says in your notes, he says, I must ask you to ask your female readers at this time, how would you be respond to being praised by your husband like this? Probably like being told all these things, right? <laughs> and then, and Dr. Jeremiah says, yes, how would you like to find out? <laughs> Get the hint, he's told me. Dr. Jeremiah has a sense of humor, right? Then in verse 15, he comes back to that water imagery again. He says, You're a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. She's now standing before him for all his loving delight and his only. This blocked fountain that he keeps talking about is now beginning to be unblocked. The waters can flow, and everything flows out of it. She's his, and everything is ready to move on. And I want to move on with that. Well, one last thing is we begin to see as we get through the satisfaction of everything that's going on. We see now as how the Song of Solomon is, is we talk about how the Song of Solomon has been divided into sections, the dating part, the courtship, the wedding, and then of course the, the marriage of Solomon and Shulamite. If we study this passage that we're reading in its Hebrew language, we see that the next two verses truly stand at the precise center of this poem. So if you were reading this in Hebrew, the part that we're at right now, excuse me, would be the exact center of this poem. Everything up at this point is meant, uh, led to this, and everything else will lead away from it. This is the exact center. There are 111 lines from Solomon 1 1 to Solomon 4 15. Now there are 111 lines from Solomon 5 2 to the end of the book. Those two central verses are the final one in chapter 4 and the first in chapter 5. 
Now, why should we find that amazing? Because this book is carefully and artfully constructed so that this is the geographical center of what he's trying to get across here. The book is 111 lines long with, it's with central thought and 111 lines all throughout. Right between the two central verses, everything changes. The two individuals are wiped out and one flesh represents. How about that? And Dr. Jeremiah says only God could do that. Even if you tried to write it, you probably couldn't do it. Nothing coincidental that this is the center point of the book. The book certainly lends itself as this grand tour of love between men and women, from meeting to mating to maturing, and right at the minute center of it is the marriage itself and everything that we see through it. So perfect that no poet could do it but God. But one of the things that we close out as we talk about this desire for intimacy as we close out, Shulamite my pet talked twice. She had made a statement in chapter 2, verse 7, and verse 3, 5, where she said, I adjure you, O brother, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you are not to stir up or wake in love until it pleases. She said that twice, right? To her, they were written to her friends, and maybe telling herself that. Wait for the moment when it's God's choosing. Certainly, just not only true of the, the sexual expression, but everything else that we face in life. Certainly quite a difference for our microwave generation that we got to have everything down. Fast food people, try now, buy later. Psalm of Psalms helps us understand there's some things worth waiting for. And good things come to those who wait. And she says now, well, she said it twice before, wait till the time's right, wait till the time's right. Look what she says now. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that its spices may flow. Let my beloved come to the garden and eat its pleasant fruit. She waited for this moment, and the time is right. Do I need to say anything else? She's ready to become his wife and the woman he dreams about. And just now, we fade out of chapter 4 and begin chapter 5. Uh, in a time when Hollywood was a little more discreet, the record did the same with love scenes. Uh, you know, the couple would be kissing, and then it would go to black, and then it would move on to the next ring. Now, to show you everything, right? Solomon now speaks once again, and he catches us up on what's happened while we were turning the page. He said, I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spouse. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey, and I've drunk my wine with my milk. Isn't that something? After four chapters of build up, Solomon closed at the moment of truth, and we're just happy to move on to the other side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In one verse, Solomon uses the word my an amazing nine times. It's hard to miss the emphasis here. Shudamite would talk about her husband the same way from now on. So the couple now belongs to one another. They're mine and love. Notice now how the roles of Shudamite come together in this verse. He calls her my garden, my sister, my spouse. She's his. But I said, in the midst of those two people involved in Solomon and Shudamite, and I said there's a third party that we have that makes an interjection there at the end of chapter 5. There's a postscript to this word of light found in that part. And it says, Eat, O friends, drink to death, drink deeply, O beloved ones. The eating and drinking that most scholars agree, agree is simply more than just sexual poetry here. Who is speaking? There's a special guest appearance which we talked about, a tease about who's here. Actually, it's kind of a compelling mission. Who would turn up at the very center of a verse to top off the wedding night and begin the next portion of the book? It's not the true friends, the bridesmaids and the grooms, for they wouldn't be present at this moment in the room, the honeymoon room. It doesn't seem to be Solomon or Shulamite who's addressing the visitors at this moment. Craig Whitman has a very interesting suggestion. He said, I want you to do a little detective work and consider who would have the means, motive, and opportunity. Who other than the couple would be present on the wedding night? Who is the one other entity who would be intimate with the bride and groom and could encourage the pleasure they enjoy? Perhaps more important, who deserves the pride of place at the epicenter of this book? 
God himself is speaking. Here at the center of this book, the center of all sexuality, you see the voice of God is being heard. Most scholars come to that conclusion that these are in fact his words, his blessing, his delight, in their delight of what they've experienced. What did I say the title of this book says? What God Thinks of Sex. Here's what he, he endorses the pleasure between a husband and a wife. And it, become, it comes to them and to all of us courtesy of God's creative hand. Think about that. Craig Whitman says, God is glad they have run deeply of the fountain of love. Two of his own have experienced love in all of its beauty and fervor and purity that he intended for them. In fact, he urges them on more. This is his attitude toward the giving of their love to each other. And by the way, this is his attitude towards couples today. Who but God is at the center of this book, the Bible, marriages, and our marriages today? How beautiful that certainly God has given an endorsement of sexual passion in marriage, and not only his endorsement, but his exhortation to go about it. Quote, unquote. I like that statement. So now we know the truth of what God thinks about sex and intimacy. How could anything be so joyful, so essential, so life-giving, and not have God's approval? After all, what does James say? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of the Lord, with whom there's no variation. Well, Dr. Jeremiah says, you know, like we all know people who have grown up in churches where sex was the ultimate dirty word where it was never mentioned in any kind of positive light whatsoever. Yes, we know this is an easy gift to misuse. We realize that, I'm going to quote, springs aren't to flow, and those gardens aren't to be opened outside the marriage. But to never mention its wonderful, essential nature is like never acknowledging the beauty of a sunset, the power of an assembled body of Christ, or the appeal of a newborn child. There's no gift from God that certainly can't be twisted by the evil one. And what a tragedy that we have allowed the enemy to keep us from realizing the essential goodness of such a foundation gift of life. Quote, unquote. Well, he says one other thing that this reminds us of as we go to the book of Revelation and read uh, what happens after the rapture and after um, we go to the church is raptured to heaven and all the saints are coming up, is that marriage suffer of the land. Well, the church, we know, is the bride of Christ. Jesus is the bride, and when the church is gathered in heaven, they come together in that one bit where we feast and gather at the table and celebrate the oneness that we have with the Lord in heaven. Certainly, a fitting analogy to where we close chapter 4 and chapter 5 in this book. Next week is what we call love at life speed. Do you ever remember if you? You ever went, we had this great moment. You know, maybe it was when you went off on your wedding, you went on a nice honeymoon, and you come back, and guess what? Life returns. Yeah. <laughs> the honeymoon is over. The honeymoon is over. Next week, we're going to find out something happens after the honeymoon that begins to be a little flying appointment in this marriage situation. So you got to tune in next week, or come next week, to find out what's going on in Shulamite and Sodom. Marriage. Now, I went a little bit over, but certainly uh, I wanted to finish it. Does anybody have anything to add? I tried to hammer up the kid gloves. <laughs> Every groom and bride should study the Song of Solomon before their wedding. Remember the book that Dr. Jeremiah introduced us to it, but he said, Before you plan your wedding, to plan, before you plan your wedding, plan your marriage. I think Uncle James would have been proud of this chapter. I get Aunt Karen's seal of approval back there. If nothing else, I will close this with a prayer and we will adjourn door will until next week. Father, we just thank you once again for the privilege it is to study your word. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to teach it. And you for giving me a word to speak, and I certainly couldn't do it on my own. We ask that you, uh, as men and women, not only who are married, but or in relationships or just in a relationship with friends and family learn how to treat one another. And to, as we discussed over and over, to die to self, 
and put others beforehand, just as you put others before you when you came to earth, lived, and died, and paid our sin debt in full. We thank you once again for this wonderful crowd who showed up tonight to hear your word. And I pray that we touch their heart, those listening, that they hear it, heard it. And I pray that everything we said and done tonight will bring glory to you, because that's what we're here for. We lift up each one here and ask for that blessing. For those who couldn't be here tonight, we ask a blessing upon those. We certainly pray for those traveling tonight and maybe going places that you be with them and give them safety and travel. We lift up our country from our leaders to the White House down to our local uh, municipality that you guide decision making and lead us in the right direction. Certainly we pray for uh, our military who protects us that you keep them out of harm's way. We pray for the people of Ukraine, especially the Christians over there, that you protect those, the innocent, from danger. We pray for our missionaries, not only out in full foreign soil, but we've learned that they're coming to our country to witness to us, that you be with those and give them the words they may speak. We pray a special blessing upon every pastor who is represented here tonight in every church that's represented here, every musician, every Sunday school teacher, that they would stand and teach the truth and let everybody know what it's like to come and taste your truth. We thank you for all these things. We know that you wrote this book, you allowed us to gather because you love us. You always have and you always will. Amen. Amen.